Welcome everyone to Columbia Business School Executive Education. I'm Charles Bouillon and I'm here today with Tendra Wadwa for the Reimagining Leadership for the New World of Business webinar. Before I introduce you, Tendra, I will just go over some brief logistics which will appear on your screen. A recording will be available after the webinar. We also encourage you to tweet about the webinar using the hashtag CBSExecEd. And finally, we want to hear from you during the webinar, so please type your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer as much of those as we can in the last 10 minutes of the webinar. But now, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest today. Hitendra is a professor of practice at Columbia Business School, where he teaches MBA courses and executive programs on personal leadership and success and driving strategic impact. Hitendra is also the founder of Mentora, where he and his team help organizations do leadership development and cultural transformation based on the science of personal leadership. He is the recipient of the Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence and numerous other awards for his work at Columbia. But now it is time to hand over to you, Itendra. Thank you, Charles. And uh, it's a great joy to be here with all of you. Uh, again, I'll say again, because um, you know, it's been a privilege for me to be part of some of these webinars in the past, although it's been a little bit of a gap since I was here last. And so I hope you've all been doing well. We are living today in what I might call a hyper VUCA world. The 21st century was already becoming quite VUCA, you know, at the very start of this century, 20 years ago, as in volatile and uncertain and complex and ambiguous. But of course, the affairs of the year 2020 have further accelerated and intensified those trends whether it is in the arena of public health or of politics or of like social divisions or of technology-based disruptions, et cetera. We are today living in a world which is VUCA on steroids. And yes, there's a vaccine around the corner or another one, but I think, you know, we're all having the sinking feeling that this is not going away anytime soon. I don't mean the pandemic and hopefully that will, but the pace of change, the complexity of issues, the kind of challenges we face, both within our organizations and outside, that's not going away. And I would say that one of the primary conclusions one can draw from this is that we need to create space for intelligence, for ideas, for innovation, for transformation to emerge from any part of our team, from any part of our organization, because those of us who were the experts, who were the seasoned hands, who were the senior leaders, you know, we may or may not be actually in a position to know how to play this new game. We don't even know the rules of this new game relative to the game that we were mastering and qualified to play in the past. The more qualifications we have, the more expertise we have, the more experience we have, the more seniority we have, the more authority we have, maybe that's actually a limiter to what it is that we can do. And we may need to lean on and depend on the initiative and ideas and thoughts of a much larger milieu of people around us. This is what I call the need to activate collective intelligence. By the way, um, I invite you all to use chat as a way to stay in touch and stay connected with each other, share questions, thoughts, ideas. I know I benefit from reading that even after the event itself. I may not be able to do full justice to it during the event. Charles is gonna be helping me with reviewing questions that come from you and doing that as part of Q&A a little later. But you share as a way to keep a little bit of a rich dialogue going with each other as well, even as I go through what I have to, to offer up to you here, all right? I'm gonna speak for about 20, 25 minutes. We're gonna do about five, 10 minutes of Q&A and that'll bring us to closure today, right? So collective intelligence, the idea of harnessing the potential, the possibilities, the ideas of everyone in your organization, right? And let me start with a story. This is a story of a research director and she was wanting to do really great work at the labs that was run by a certain director who was, again, excellent at his science, but also not necessarily the perfect manager. So there was one time that she went up to him to speak to him and she had learned some of the kinds of tools of leadership that we'll be talking about today. And so this is how that conversation transpired, right? She, she asked him, she said, Dr. So-and-so, did you read that research paper that I left on your desk? Because we have to send it out for publication. And he looks at her and he's feeling like, you know what, that paper was really poor. And so I just, I just threw it into the trash bin. And, and she looks at him and she says, Dr. So-and-so, I agree with you. The writing in that paper is not up to your mark. 
In fact, when I was in graduate school a few years ago, one of the things I really admired about you and your labs is the accessibility and the inspiration in your writing in addition to the excellent research. And I can tell you one thing, that while the writing may not be at your level, the actual research we've done here over the last year is incredible, is powerful, is important. And I know that one thing, Dr. So-and-so, that you really believe in and stand for is to do fast dissemination in today's you know, 21st century times of scientific findings once they come out from your labs to empower other scientists around the world to restudy those issues, to build on them and to validate them. And so my writing may not be at your level today, but there's no reason my writing cannot be, cannot be improved and better tomorrow. Why don't you mentor me? Why don't you guide me? Give me feedback on that paper. Why don't I pick it up and bring it back to you? And um, he looked at her and he said, oh, well, okay, let, let's, let, let, let's, let's, let's look at it again, right? And so she brings it up and then he, um, take this line off, you know, it just doesn't make much sense here, or this paragraph could be improved on, you know, in this way and that way. And, you know, he wasn't really back to being like an incredibly graceful and thoughtful, you know, manager in that moment. But for somebody who was, let's say a scientific genius, who really ultimately cared for perfection and for advancement of his team and his craft, she was able to, in that moment, get the best out of him. And so the thesis I want to offer you is that here is a way to define leadership in a way that includes her, not just him, i.e. not just people in formal roles that are considered to be leadership, but actually anybody and everybody in the organization so that no one ever pulls back from that mantle of leadership. And this view of leadership as a leadership, which is the way I define it in my class at Columbia, in our work at Mentora with corporations, as well as in the teachings that we will do here at Columbia in executive education in a couple of programs on leading in transformative times and personal leadership and success that we are gonna be running uh, very soon. And this definition of leadership is that leadership is about bringing out the best in yourself. And it's about bringing out the best in others in all situations, in all situations, in all situations in the pursuit of a common positive purpose. Now, of course, you know, the, the question that this raises is, what does one mean by best? What does one mean by best, right? And um, one way to think about it is that best is about certain qualities that you need to identify, which really successful and great leaders have embraced over the years, right? And so we can look through history, we can look through science, and we can come up with leader has to be decisive, has to be adaptive, has to be agreeable, and what have you, right? But for any such research and any such list you see, which by the way, the experts are proliferating out there, right? In all kinds of articles, books and everything, right? That here are the five qualities of great leadership, et cetera. What you actually find is that there are these opposite qualities which are actually equally relevant. Yes, it makes sense to be decisive, but it also makes sense to be really patient. It makes sense to be adaptive, but also makes sense to be really tenacious and keep fighting the good fight be agreeable, but also at times to be, you know, in a positive way, very assertive and kind of like hold your ground, right? Be connected, but also disconnected, pull back, et cetera, right? And so for me, when I looked at, the, did a meta study of all of the research out there on leadership, what I discovered is that you have to be everything and the complete opposite. What do you think of that? Use chat to give me your reactions and thoughts to this idea. Um, by the way, make sure that you settle it for uh, set it up for all panelists and attendees to make sure that you're chatting with each other, not just with me. But you know, so so set the setting in the two box to all panelists and attendees. What do you think about this idea, which is more and more to me really central to the quest that we have to embrace, which is that ultimately there is no formula for how to be a great leader from the outside about seven qualities or 10 qualities or 15 qualities, because you've got to be everything and the complete opposite. It depends on the moment. It depends on the situation. And ultimately, we have to form a approach to leadership which puts you in the driver's seat, does not put an expert in the driver's seat, doesn't put like an author in the driver's seat, doesn't put like um, a professor in the driver's seat. You've got to be in the driver's seat because you know better than anybody else your lived history, your past kind of with this individual, what's at stake, what's happening in the moment, et cetera. And you may have to act out one behavior or the opposite. There's no single checklist or toolkit that can just give you a prescriptive answer for all the situations you'll be thrust in in life. For those of us who have been really stepping out of our comfort zone in this year and in in, in 2020, we know that suddenly we've had to act out behaviors that we may never have had to in the past few years. 
because of the extra kind of, you know, uncertainty, vulnerability, and complexity of today's time. Okay, cool, cool. So if that's what leadership looks like from the outside, then the thesis I want to offer to you is that the way we will make sense of leadership is by moving to the inside, by moving to a space I call your inner core. Your inner core is the space of purity and grace that lies within each of us. You have it and I have it. You know when you're drifting into that space and when you're drifting out of that space. When you are in your inner core, you are operating without attachment. You are operating without any insecurities or any kind of biases, or any kind of like, you know, emotional pulls. And instead you're able to see things through a perfect mental lens. And you're able to be really connected to a higher cause and to be deeply committed to the people around you and curious and open to new ideas and thoughts and receptive to truth, receptive to truth in whichever form it comes. That is your inner core. And again, we drift in and out of it from time to time. How does one develop this inner core? And I'm gonna to offer to you here these five core energies I spoke about in the abstract for today's session, these five core energies that will help you get connected to your inner core and to activate that core in everything you do. The first of those energies, uh, actually, sorry, before I get there, why energy, why leadership and energy? Because just think about it. In the 20th century, what we discovered is that, you know, through Einstein, that matter that we see all around us, right? The things we touch and who we are, that's actually in some ways an illusion because behind that matter is energy, condensed energy. And if that's true of matter, maybe that's true of leadership as well. That the behavior and actions and speech we see on the outside is actually just the activation of energy from the inside. Five energies. The first of it I call purpose. And purpose is about pursuing a path that is paved with values and goals are the milestones, a purpose-driven path. And the important thing in this energy is to not get too attached to certain outcomes, to certain goals as an individual, as a team, or as a business, but to recognize that there will always be factors outside your control. And you have to find a way to adapt to them, to respond to them. And therefore you may need to, from time to time, take a fresh look at your goals and keep evolving and changing those goals, but not in a way that makes you feel missionless, but that is always in the service of your values, is always in the service of your purpose. And so purpose is this energy where you reaffirm and connect with something enduring and beautiful from within, and then re-express it in a way that makes you very resilient and adaptive to the present moment, individually, as well as collectively. Wisdom is the energy where you commit yourself to looking for truth in all matters, the truth in the conflict you're having with a certain individual, the truth in how you're seeking to express a certain value, but you're finding resistance from society around you. In any and all of these situations, we have to be able to eliminate bias, eliminate quick premature judgments, eliminate any kind of you know, emotional surges that take us in the direction of anger, irritation, dismissiveness, condescension, but instead we can use those energies when they're activated in the service of our purpose. We find courage in anger. We find commitment in anxiety because we are really committed to eliminating the risks or we are really courageous about expressing thoughts and truths and ideas that the anger is actually allowing us to finally have the awareness for, et cetera, right? So how do you use emotions and how do you clean up your inner kind of thought space in a way that makes you approach individually as well as collectively as a team, as an organization, every situation from that lens of wisdom. The third of these five energies is love. And love recognizes that you can't make it alone. You've never made it alone. You are here because of the faceless, you know, and, and um, at times just, uh, you know, um, long-standing contributions of just so many. And so love recognizes that we are interdependent, interconnected beings. And there is a natural state of the heart where we take joy in other people's joy and we find success in other people's success. And how do you activate that energy in everything you do? You know, at work, for instance, in the way you manage people, in the way you serve clients, in the way you partner with other individuals, et cetera. How do you create the sense of belonging, the sense of compassionate, empathetic connection with people so that at a human to human level, there's a beautiful equation that is starting to take form. That is the love energy. And yet do it in a way that doesn't cause any kind of radical like um, compromises to the ultimate pursuit of your purpose blending love with wisdom and purpose so that you're able to make hard calls, you're able to have tough conversations, 
but from a place of love. Growth is the fourth of the fifth energies, and growth is about recognizing that you and I and all of us and our teams and our organization are always a work in progress, regardless how much we've stumbled, regardless how much we've failed, regardless of what personality or character or other liabilities we've had, our brains are plastic. If we put a certain focused effort with the right sort of tools coming from the science of learning and the science of expert practice, what we find is that any or all of us can over time evolve and become a new and improved and a better version of ourselves. So looking for that untapped potential that lies within every individual team and parts of your organization is the growth energy. The fifth and final energy is what I call self-realization. And self-realization is recognizing that behind all of this kind of like mess and craziness and just ebbs and flows of life lies a space of pure consciousness, pure awareness, pure stillness, pure tranquility, even love and joy within us. And you know, inspiring leaders like a Mother Teresa or a Mahatma Gandhi have discovered that core, have found practices, whether it is just you know, some practices of solitude, taking walks in nature, praying, chanting, meditating. Any or all of these kinds of practices takes us into a place where we're almost having, if you want to call it, like a spiritual bath within. Letting go of the debris of kind of hurts and disappointments and distractions getting to that place of purity from where our true spirit arises and then expressing that through purpose and wisdom and love and growth. Those are the four energies that I want, the five energies that I wanted to share with you today. And so therefore, this is the way this model works, right? The way this model works is that you start by activating your core as a leader. And then you project these five energies into your team, into your colleague, into your partners and others that you're working with. And by projecting these energies thoughtfully, you are seeking to activate their core. Because when your core is activated and their core is activated, that you have then the conditions for a common core. And the common core is this beautiful space where the thoughts you're having and the feelings you're having and the values that you're all aspiring to pursue are the same. So you're similar and connected from within, not just from without. Now, how do you attain this kind of mastery? Um, well, the traditional way to think about this was to train people, right, in all kinds of leadership programs, and I've been, you know, kind of uh, guilty of this, on a whole range of different kinds of disciplines, as though each of these stands separately on its own. But if you go back, you know, but, but, but this, by the way, becomes really overwhelming. It's so hard to be able to play all these games at the same time, to have all these toolkits, all these checklists, all these books that we read on influencing and inspiring and difficult conversations and what have you. And I am inviting us to consider a whole different model for how we should be approaching this game through a much more simpler and authentic lens, right? If you go back to that story that I shared with you about the research scientist, then did you notice in her case, which of these was she doing? Which of these was she doing? Wasn't she doing all of these? She was having a difficult conversation with the boss. She was building trust with him. She was influencing him. She was changing his behavior. She was inspiring him. She was kind of like even coaching him. I mean, this is the insanity of like the traditional approach. I don't say, you know, I don't mean that sort of derogatorily. I mean, the 20th century has given us some beautiful things, but we have to rise now to a 21st century level of thinking. We have to hit the refresh on the way we have trained people and developed people. And my thesis is it's gonna come by a radical shift away from this model, because notice that in that present situation, any one of these toolkits would not have been sufficient. She needed all these toolkits at the same time, right? And so the approach that I'm gonna to propose to you is an approach which I've seen from studying the great leaders in history, that they never went to an executive education program at Columbia, most of them, right? The Gandhis, the Mother Teresa, the Eleanor Roosevelt's, the Catherine Grahams, the Abraham Lincolns, the Martin Luther Kings, the Nelson Mandela's. You know, none of them went to an executive education program to my knowledge, but somehow they simply were able to figure things out. And that comes when you engage in the simplicity of what I call action. And my inspiration for this is coming from the world of sports. Because in sports, for instance, what you notice is that if you wanted to learn and master basketball, right? The way you do that is to break the game into small steps, very, very small little actions. Bounce the ball, pass the ball, throw it into the hoop. And then you create these action paths, right? So that a player is taught certain actions and then is taught how to sequence them in the right way to get to play a winning game. And if you think about it, go back to the research scientist. She was actually engaging in a series of simple actions and creating a winning action path for herself, right? 
the first action she engaged in was disarming, which is like, you know, he was saying this is a bad paper and she just found something to agree in him. She didn't really agree it was a bad paper, but she agreed that, you know what, the writing in the paper is not at your level. Then she found something to appreciate in him, just to make him kind of like feel in a better and gooder and more collaborative space. Your writing is awesome. I used to really love it when I was in graduate school. Then she fused opposites by saying, the writing is not at your level and the research is amazing, fusing opposites. Then she appealed to his purpose, which is like, I know that you started this lab to do and propagate very quickly amazing research. And let's do that here. So she appealed to his purpose and then she applied the growth mindset. My writing may not be at your level today. There's no reason it can't be there tomorrow with the right coaching. Five simple actions. By the way, if the research director had come to our program and he said like, mend my ways, make me a better manager. These are the actions that I might have offered to him from our action toolkit, right? So what I've done in my research and in our work both at Columbia and at Mentora is that when we train individuals and organizations on leadership, we train them on the activation of the core on the activation of these five energies and ultimately the translation of them into a set of actions like the kinds that you see here, right? And the cool thing is that while there is one core and just five energies, if you learn just five actions per energy, a total of about 25 actions, you can actually make 8 million of these kinds of action paths because that is how nature is. Nature is incredibly complex and diverse on the outside, but simple building blocks on the inside. Millions of substances, only 110 elements. Millions of species, only four chemical bases. Millions of books, only 26 letters of the alphabet. And so this is the quest I'm on, which is what are those 26 letters of the leadership alphabet, right? The building blocks, the Lego blocks. And I'm excited about what it is that we have discovered through the research that I've been now doing for the last about 12 years, the simplicity of these actions. The one quality this requires, if we have to shift into saying that leadership is like sports, it requires a certain energy, it requires certain simple actions, and it requires these action paths to be formed. The one quality that this most requires from us is what I would say is humility. Humility to be open to recognizing your gaps, my gaps, and engaging in this new learning in kind of like how we would learn golf or basketball or tennis or any other sport or playing a musical instrument. Start with the basics and just practice, practice, practice. So on that note, I'm gonna just end with recognizing that this to me is a model that is more authentic because it puts the burden on you to make the choices for yourself, but it gives you the energies and the action library to choose from in making your way. It is more agile because you can keep flexibly changing which action you pick and you can pick from 8 million of these actions. And thirdly, it is more attainable because Rather than complex, elaborate toolkits and separate toolkits for different kinds of situations and business problems, et cetera, it's all the same. There are these prime numbers and these prime numbers are these very simply put, these simple actions. As long as they're authentically being activated through purpose, wisdom, love, growth, and self-realization from within. All right, and so, that's it. I'm going to pause now and uh, invite Charles back to, you know, help me with uh, with questions that might be on your mind. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Itendra. This was absolutely great. Um, so we've now got time for some some questions. Uh, and for all of you watching, you can still submit your questions in the QA button A box. But um, we'll get started um, with a question from Keith. Uh, what makes a positive purpose as opposed to any other purpose? Yeah. See, uh, two thoughts. Um, now, the conventional way of thinking about it is that a positive purpose is one that advances humanity. Right? That's one simple way of thinking about it. I would add a couple of caveats to it from my research and studying kind of the way Lincoln evolved his purpose and so did Gandhi, et cetera. One is that you got to choose your subset of humanity. What is the one way you want to serve humanity and what is the target group that you're going to end up serving? Because you know life is short, Energy and resources are limited for any one of us or our organizations or our movements. And so you've got to pick your battleground and you've got to like be really dedicated and committed almost exclusively to that battleground, not spread yourself thin by taking on every cause that is a noble cause on this planet. You just have to take it on faith that others will be doing the other beautiful work that the planet also needs. That said, the other critical requirement I would offer 
is that you cannot, in the service of your community for your cause, do it out of a, out of a uh, spirit of hatred, resentment, or um, you know, or or, or a, you know, or, or or a disservice, or a theft from others. That's what I've seen from the great leaders. They served their community, their flock, but they weren't doing it in a zero-sum game as a way to take other things, like things away from other people. They were doing it in a way to ultimately say, I respect there's a rest of humanity and you want to do your stuff, but here is the cause and here's the community that I'm in the service of. Right, cool. Well, thank you. Um, next, we have a question for Beverly. How can organizations leverage these components into assessment of high potential talent? Yeah. It's an excellent question. We have been working towards developing metrics through which these kinds of qualities, which are more invisible and inner, can actually be brought to the surface and measured. We have a library, for example, of small role plays that we invite people to take on, small little, if you want to call it micro simulations. And by collecting that data over the course of a 30 minute test, for example, or 360 data from your peers, uh, we have started to quantify the consistency and the, um, you know, the, 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 the impact of these kinds of energies being put into action in the workplace and develop metrics, metrics that relate to, do you understand leadership through this lens? Do you understand these actions? Are you being able to successfully practice them in a simulated context? And then finally, are you able to put them practically into application in the field? If this is something of interest to you, write to me. You'll see my email, just my Columbia you know, account, right? Write to me. I would love to have my team share more with you about the way that we are helping work with organizations to develop these metrics and start to create a whole new, if you want to call it performance review scorecard for leadership. Great. Uh, next, we have Robert. Um, for how long can anyone be an effective leader in a prolonged VUCA environment? You know, look, uh, I, I, I respect that question. We, we're all feeling the strain, right, of, of this time, some at a very personal level and some both at a personal and professional level. The one thing I would encourage you to consider is that while learning and leadership sounds like it is effortful, actually, if you do it the right way, it should yield energy to you. It should yield more energy to you, either by releasing it from wasteful expenditure of energy, like in the wrong emotions, for example, or by activating it through the certain kind of mindfulness-based discipline or emotional management discipline, et cetera, that you take on. And so ultimately, 30 minutes, let's say, a day spent on learning and on nurturing, in a sense, your leadership from within through these five energies. If you think of a 16-hour work there, right, you spend 30 minutes of that, that's roughly about, you know, six, seven percent of the day. Well, you should get much more six, seven percent rewards back in terms of improved productivity and improved performance. And so the ROI on these kinds of investments, when done right, more than makes up for it. And you should be even more therefore ready and prepared to play the VUCA game for as long as it lasts. Great. Um, then we have, we've got one from Alicia. Um, organizations have become even more horizontal during COVID-19. How to devote them to, le to learn without burnout? Well, I think it's the same, my, my same answer on that one, Charles, which is just notice what I just shared, right? Like do the math, prove it to yourself and to people that ultimately this is about working and learning like smarter, not harder. You know, hard work was like the 20th century metric. The 21st century to me, 21st century metric has to be like, are you mindfully present? Are you fully engaged and committed? Are you able to keep your emotions in a sense at bay and channel them in the service of your purpose? Because then, Two minutes of time with somebody can be incredibly special, incredibly beautiful. One second can just give you a flash of insight that addresses the problem you've been struggling with for the last five days. So the onus shouldn't just be on the quantum of work and the effort, but the quality of work and effort. Right. Uh, and we have time, I think, for one last one. Uh, one from Lizzie. What are tips to address colleagues, coworkers who can be obstacles to one's inner core and leadership? Very good. As I answer that, can I invite you all in chat to just kind of share what is your big takeaway from our conversation today? What is like your big aha? Uh -huh? if, if it's a question, say it as a question. If it's something that you're feeling like, 
you know, I don't agree with this, then just share that. I would just love to see a diversity of voices in chat about what your kind of reactions are, right? To the conversation we've had about leadership starts from within, it's from the core, it's these five energies to put them into action, use the sports analogy, simple actions, practice, 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 get away from the notion of needing to have like 20 different kinds of competencies and et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, so to that, okay. So now to the question you asked, Charles, um, see what this model says is that think about this notion of 100% personal responsibility. It's your responsibility to activate your core. And it's your responsibility to do your best to help other people get activated at their core. Now in doing that, if they're not in a listening and learning mode, if they're going to resist, you know, you can just do your best. And if I have time, I would share stories with you about how Mandela influenced and warmed the hearts up of his jailers when he was in prison. You know, to give you an illustration of how even in situations where it seems like the other person is not gonna listen, they're in greater position of power and authority, et cetera, there are certain devices we can use to help activate their core. And so as long as we are doing our best, as long as we are doing our best, that's all we can do. There will always be circumstances beyond our control. There will always be successes and at times defeats, you know, pushing forward as well as retreats that we have to make on that quest, on that journey towards the advancement of our purpose and, and mission. And, uh, you know, and, and, and so a great sign of maturity in a leader is to recognize that at the end of the day, the outcome on the outside is something that you only marginally control but you can certainly maximize the conditions for success. You can maximize the conditions for success by taking 100% personal responsibility to activate your core and strive to do your best to bring that of others as well. Of course, the how-to part of it is the richer conversation than we can have today. That's great. Thank you, Ritendra. I think that's all we have time for today. Um, thank you, Ritendra, so much for your time and uh, for this great webinar. Thank you everyone for your great questions. Uh, we will follow up soon with the recording and we hope to see you soon in one of our programs, maybe next week for leadership and transformative times or even next month for the personal leadership and success program, both with Etendra. All the best and have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you all. Take care. Godspeed. Enjoy Thanksgiving.